I'm going to introduce I'm going to introduce all of you, but both of you individually in a minute. Uh, but let me just say to you, Team Softy, congratulations on your film. It's a fantastic film. It's an important film. And for those of you who joining us who might not know, Softy premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2020. And that was before COVID hit and made film festivals more virtual. Um, and there at Sundowns, uh, Softy won the Jury Award for Best Editing. It has also gone on to show at multiple festivals around the world, winning prizes and critical acclaim. And back home in Kenya, it's also packed up uh, cinemas. Um, it's also been broadcast on television stations around the world, has a very novel marketing campaign. I've seen pictures of Softy masks, uh, Sam and Miriam. Um, and it's also currently on a very extensive impact campaign that Miriam's going to speak about a little later. And of course, with its sort of extensive and important subject matter, we can see why. So it's my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Sam and Miriam, to uh, our audience today. And I'm going to introduce you very briefly, very modestly, because there's a lot to tell. But in the interest of time, we have Sam Soko. Sam is a producer and director who founded the production company Lightbox Africa. Um, he is the director and also the co-producer of Softy, the co-editor of Softy, and he also filmed a bulk of the film. And then we have Miriam Ayu, delighted that you're here today. Miriam is an impact producer and community engagement strategist who works in Nairobi. And for over eight years, she's accumulated experience in implementing outreach initiatives in film with a, in a range of social impact areas. And um, Miriam is currently underway in the thick of the Softy impact campaign. Uh, so Sam, maybe shout out and say hello. I know you're in New York. Just <laughs> tell us what you're doing here very briefly. What hey, doing hi. Here? Thank, thanks so much for having me. I see there's a couple of familiar faces <laughs> listening in of familiar pictures <laughs> um and you know thanks so much for having us and um i hope we have a candid conversation about our journey and yeah what we've been up to so far okay and miriam miriam because you'll only be speaking us uh to us in the latter part of the session it would be great if you could just say just say hello so we could hear your voice <laughs> and also just maybe quickly how you when you join the softy team on the impact part and then yeah then i'll take it back and continue i agree thank you so much for having me as well um it's great to be in these kind of conversations learning from other great filmmakers um, and sharing our story um i joined the softy team in around early 2019 um about let's say six to seven months before the premiere um, so I've been working on the impact campaign since then and still going strong. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Barry, and thanks, Sam. So the way we thought we'd run this masterclass is really just it's a deep dive for you to speak, as you said, candidly and openly. We'd really appreciate that. And so we're going to give it to you, Sam, first to speak for about 20, 30 minutes. Um, tell us about your filmmaking process. And then uh, I may have some follow up questions. Then we'll hand it over to Miriam, who's going to give us a presentation. We're very happy about that. And then for whatever remaining time, we'll pursue questions. And whoever is out there, we're very happy if you start sending your, your questions in the chat. So Sam, I mean, just to begin with you, I remember when I met you a few years ago and it was before you had finished making Softy and we were chatting in Nairobi. And I'll, I'll remember because you said to me, you know, this film just started off as a short video. <laughs> I think you said it was a protest instruction video. Right. Which yeah. And now what seems to have happened since that original idea is that you've thrown yourself into this long-term relationship with Bonnie Face and his family. You've also thrown yourself into the thick of politic, Kenyan election campaign politics, which, can, of, 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 which also had a bit of a dangerous edge as we see in the film. And yeah, and I think what's happened is that this film that you've crafted with these, with layers of the two so elegantly, the layer of the family, 
the, the family dynamics, the, the personal, together with the Kenyan political sphere, with the uh, weaving in the colonial legacies, all of that, I think, and the tensions between the two and also the interconnectedness between the two and the mutual, mutuality between the two, I think it really gives the film its immense power. Um, so, I mean, over time, you obviously made this film more from something that was a smaller idea into something much larger. And so, Sam, I think from you today, we, we very interested in hearing about your filmmaking journey, but also interested in hearing about how you morphed from this smaller idea into this longer character character driven narrative film. We're interested in how it is that you actually found the story as fellow filmmakers. Uh, we're interested in knowing how you built the narrative and what sort of narrative dilemmas you might have had. We're also interested in just in characters, how you approach characters, what are some of the conversations you had around access and representation and what would be in the mm -hmm. form. Also working with different kinds of personalities. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we're interested in just uh, working with other creatives, international co-productions who mm -hmm. aren't necessarily part of Kenya and don't know the nuances and how you negotiated that. We're interested mm -hmm. in maybe messages that you, when, when fundraising over a long period of time, we know funders have different agendas, what messages around your film you thought to, to give them also when it came to marketing. Um, so there's a range of things, but really it's up to you to share with us what you think is most important for us to know both as filmmakers and both as interesting audience. So Sam, there's a lot, tell us everything in the short space of time. <laughs> that's, that's too much, <laughs> but let's, let's, we'll give it a try. Um, and again, feel free to, throw in questions and I think if in the chat or something I could try and kind of engage with as much as we can um, for the next um, 20 or so minutes. Um, so again, I I think it's been what close to eight years, nine years since I would say the first time I met Boniface. And Around that time, um, again, just coming up in the film, the film space, and the idea I think that we had was in developing kind of really funky short content. Um, interesting, kind of how do we communicate and engage different members of the public? And in in our case, it was Kenyans. How do we engage Kenyans? And have them learn and not be afraid to do a couple of things such as protests. Um, and in that level of thinking and in that understanding around that time is when we met Boniface and we had a conversation with Boniface in terms of like, we can film. So Boniface at the time was also like coming up as an activist and he was a, probably the most flamboyant activist um, in Kenya, and he'd pulled off a couple of really symbolic, audacious protests. Um, I think at that time he had taken like co coffins to parliament and set them on fire. And we were like, what? We should find a way to capture not only the thinking, but also um, make something kind of like there will be a how to manual. Like, if I want to put together a protest and I want to speak out and I want to engage with with certain subjects in my community and society, perhaps this is a path I could take. So one of the first things that we filmed was, and in this time, I, I would say we had no, like this was supposed to be a quick gig. It was supposed to be something we'll do for a day, max, maybe two, and you add it for another two, three days. And yeah, you put it on YouTube, and you're done. So there was no thinking of this is where we can get money or we're gonna fundraise. There was no thinking of this, there's a storyline here that we can follow. There was nothing like that. So immediately we we shot the first protest. Um, and in this case, I I would confess I 
I I'm, I'm very scared of the camera. And I was like, if if I if anybody would hold the camera, I would run like I would mess it up. So it was more of less talking to <laughs> to friends who could film and who wouldn't be afraid to film, and also talk to other people who were filming as well to see if they could help us with the footage that they'd that shot. So after that first experience, it was like really cool. And we were like, maybe we could do another protest and then it will be like, you know, a bit, maybe 15 minutes, not five minutes. And someone could get an essence of that experience. So that journey became <laughs> more and more protest. And we had a much better inside look to the thinking of this activist who Boniface is. Now, while we were doing that, you kind of realize very quickly that you have a very important important narrative, not only from uh, like a visual aspect, but also you have an important narrative in terms of what was going on in Kenya at the same time. Because in 2013, we had just had an election and it was tribal and there was a... Uh, all this kind of, there was like, a, you would say people were unsure of what the future would be like. And uh, the future of, of political space, of the, of the civic space, of free speech. Of, so a lot of these aspects were under threat and under fire. And it kind of became important that it is possible to perhaps use our material and build it up into something else. So around that time, we got some money to do not five minutes, not 15 minutes, but maybe 20 minutes. So this is going to be like a short, like a nice short film that captures not only what's happening in the civic space, but also like learning what's going on um, in putting together protests. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because at that time, I was, I remember meeting so many people and telling them, there's this film I'm working on. It's going to be done next month. In fact, I'm looking for an editor. And, and this was way back in 20, around 2014. And in 2014, there's a couple of things that were happening at the same time um, in terms of the work that Boniface was doing. And that work started giving us, and particularly me, insight of what, of his family. Because up to that point, his wife, Njeri, was very afraid of, of having her, her, her kids and herself be in the public limelight. So the only places we would film them would be at home. And when, when there was a protest or something was being organized, but you almost have never gotten um, moments where they were just, you know, just being a family. Now, <laughs> the crazy part of all those things was, at the end of 2014, because we had very little money and we'd shot quite a number of footage, we had to share a big chunk of our footage. Um, we had to put our footage, we had to keep it in um, a server space of this creative hub where we were working from. Um, around the beginning of 2014, that server crashed and we lost almost two thirds of everything would shot up to that point. <laughs> yep. And I remember that time we were so sure there's nothing we're making anymore. Like this film is done. There's no story there. Um, and I honestly kind of gave up. Um, it was more of like, the least you could do maybe is come back, do your the five minutes, and then kind of move on. But we Boniface continued working on the protest, like putting together these protests, and we kept filming. And as we kept filming, I developed a closer relationship with his family because you're kind of always there. You know, there's a protest or there's something, you're just there. So you're always talking, you're always chatting. The kids know who you are. Um, I remember it, be, it didn't 
I started like it was like you kind of developed this relationship with the kids to a point of I was picking up picking them up from school uh, and it's it like it just became an extra pair of furniture that <laughs> that just hangs there and towards the end of 2015 I was speaking to Jerry his wife and being like I think it's important for you to share your story because nobody, we always see a lot of activist films, but you would never see um, what, what their spouses or partners think or what their, how families react to their, their work. And she turned me down and I kept asking and I kept asking. And then one day she was like, fine, you could film me for one day, <laughs> does it? And never this is you know and we can just maybe have to go pick the kids from school and that's about it i was like great and then we'll do we can do like a short interview and then like yes you can talk maybe for like 15 minutes so we ended up doing an interview that lasted close to four hours <laughs> and <laughs> and from then on i think it became important to to build to kind of it became very clear that her story is so powerful and in many ways the window to Boniface's work and life is her like she she was the person to help us understand what the actual cost of activism is um in doing that and in filming all that and figuring all that while it was it sounds exciting and being like what now there's a story here and something is moving the reality is pitching that film was hard because every single time i would talk about the film to anyone because i'd never pitched the film to anybody before like at the pitching forums um applying to to funds like i would honestly say there was I was extremely ignorant of the particularly nonfiction documentary space. So I did not know any community. I did not know any person. The closest of a community was at the time, the, our, our, the, local, our, the local fund, DocuBox, was also coming up. But they were also like not as big. So it's not like we knew a lot of these people. But everything changed when I met when one of a really good friend of mine got funding from DocuBox, a friend called Pete, who is the director of the film I Am Samuel. Now, Pete and I, well, whenever he had frustrations for I Am Samuel and I had my frustrations, we'd always vent to each other and we'd be like, oh my God, this film suck. We don't know how do we get out of here. Um, and Pete had just been, I think they'd just been supported to go to IDFA and, and had IDFA, that's at the end of 2015, and had, had come with all this, you know, all the magazines, with all this information of like, there's a film, there's a, you know, there's, there's a forum, there's all this, you can apply, you can talk to these people. So for most of 2016, um, as people were working, they got into this pitching forum called Good Pitch, and they were working on, on their pitch for Good Pitch. And I edit as well, and I love editing. So Pete asked me if I could help edit the uh, pitch trailer for Good Pitch, so which I did. And the whole time we were working on the pitch trailer, Pete is like, you should go for Edfa, you should go to Edfa. Um, and I was like, yeah, cool, you know. It's great. That's what rich filmmakers do. <laughs> I'm not there yet. Um, and then Good Pitch happened. Now, during Good Pitch, Pete introduced me to Doc Society and said, I'm working on this really cool film. And Doc Society were like, tell us all about it. And my mouth could barely open. I, 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 uh, Pete became like a hype man. So you know how you're talking about the film and you're like, um, so my film is about, uh, uh, then Pete is like Boniface Mongi. <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes, Boniface Mongi. <laughs> and we, <laughs> we had this mash of a pitch, but 
I had put together like a short demo of, of what I'd filmed so far. And they watched it and they, they were really excited by it and asked me to, they had like a fund open at the time. So they sent me a link and they told me to put together material to see if I could get a fund uh, to get some money. And that started the journey of fundraising for Softy. So by 2016, I was on the path where you're making the film and looking for money for the film and <laughs> kind of doing everything. So you're editing, you're talking to the team. And at that time, some of the people I was working with, and I'm, like I was literally begging my friends to film for me. Um, like it was, <laughs> it was a total mess of trying to make sure the film is made. But so many things happened within 2016 because if you watch the film, that's when Boniface was like, I'm going to run for office. Like, that's like so many story things were happening. And as all these things were moving together and building together, by, by 2017, I would say the film became larger than anything else for not only myself, but the importance of what was going on, it just became so important that this film needed to be made. And by that time, um, we were lucky to have gotten some support from not only Doc Society, but also Hot Docs. Now, it is when we went for Hot Docs that I met um, now a really good friend of mine, Mila Ong Tuing, who is a co-founder of I Still Film in... In Mont based in Montreal, Canada. Now, Mila really hated my first pitch of Softy. And it kind of became really important for me to make sure the film made sense until he was like, what are you trying to talk about? And something, which is another lesson that I'd, I learned along the way is because of the different people you're trying to talk, talk to the film about, everybody has their point of view of how they view your film and how they view your story. So for a lot of people, the family story felt like a weak story. So every time I would pitch the film, everybody would want to just talk about the, the activism. Um, and and the, the thing about the activism, activism film it wasn't as strong, like in terms of making it a feature film. It would have probably have worked as a short film. But I was interested in making something longer and not losing the amazing access we'd built up with Njeri and the family. Because that, that for me was still felt like the window into this conversation. And the reason why when I was talking to Mila hated the film is because I was pitching the, the activist film. And he was like, is there anything else? So I had to be like, yes, there is this other thing, but everybody tells me it doesn't work. So it's only when I started talking about the family and all of a sudden it was like, yes, that is the film. Like, it, And this is a world that we are not used to have that insight, particularly when it comes to African stories and African documentaries. And I think in, in that space and in that conversation, it built up into, that was the, the kind of foundation in many, in many cases for like a collaboration, an international collaboration, um, creative collaboration that kind of ended up building out the film as is. Um, what you've watched eventually. So we ended up having a co-production with I Still Film. Um, clearly all this work became too much. And I started also pestering a really close friend of mine who was also the producer in I Am Samuel, Tony Kamau, and being like, Tony, you need to come help me produce. You need to come help me produce. And then eventually I think Again, so many things happened, not only in the country, but also with the material, because um, probably it did help that I, I edit as well, because every single time I would talk to anyone, I had something new to show them, every single time. 
um it would be um you haven't seen me in a month and the next time you're seeing me i'm like wait let me show you what happened <laughs> it, it was it was it was like a weird editing obsession in putting to, the story together um but i think in coming to in tony coming on board in i mila and i steel and our other exec bob more coming on board um in in finding other collaborators from pbs pov and all these other people who came on board i think we were very lucky in finding collaborators that were willing and honest to access a film from a different point of view which is in this case is like a kenyan point of view because i i i kept saying it's like my primary audience for this film is kenyan but there's a universal story in there there's a story of a marriage there's a story of 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 a family trying to figure out you know what what should they choose what's what comes first for them you know what does sacrifice mean and these are all universal notes and and i think the beauty of our collaboration particularly creatively was in accepting certain certain questions of this thing doesn't make sense you see for for me as a canadian so okay how do we make it make sense but also like how do we make a film that doesn't feel preachy to a kenyan how does how does a kenyan who's actually experienced a lot of the things that they're watching how does it feel fresh and new to them and i think in 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 that kind of balance and it took us almost i think a year 7 8 months to edit but because i'd up to the point we started editing i had close to 700 hours of footage so it think the first year alone was just sifting through everything and being like what do we have what don't we have what works what threads make sense do we have the material to capture this family story that we're talking about um but we also got this opportunity to provide a moment of reflection in many cases for kenyans um and and it became important in as perhaps using the story that i had captured up to that point together with the amazing team that we have in telling the story of kenya for over the past 50 60 years so we did that for quite a bit um uh spent time editing in montreal we we were way ahead of everyone else in this zoom editing game <laughs> but uh eventually got you know something i would never forget we managed to premiere at sundance uh last year in in january and honestly we were super excited with getting the editing editing award because i think the editing award kind of just spoke to the beauty of our collaboration and how much work um had gone into um literally blood sweat and tears into coming up with the film so that's our journey in not so summary <laughs> Thank you Sam. That was that was really amazing to hear fresh from the horse's mouth. Um I mean I think what some of our audience is picking up Mickey and Diani um you know this whole issue about being a filmmaker being a filmmaker from the African continent sort of having expectations about what story you would tell so it might be a story about a politician and or about an activist. So it's very interesting that that moment that you decided that the film was about something else. Um and I'm also interested I mean I think we, people are just also interested in how do you as you fundraise I mean there's a very practical thing about getting money to match what you want to do and funders obviously have an agenda and some want funding and they want lines that are you know that you might not want to 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 follow if you can just speak a little bit about how you go about maybe pitching under those circumstances or where you draw the line um and also and relate to that also about your choice of family what was interesting you also said that you focused on the family you felt it would not be a strong enough film for longer form about 
just an activist and I'm also interested in that. I mean, is it something about also the character of Jerry versus like Bonnie face because he is quite, he's public and I think there are lots of pieces about him. I mean, and she is very different. So obviously, I mean, if you can just speak a little bit about some of the aesthetic decisions you made while you were filming around that and also just about, yeah, pitching the film for different agendas. Okay, I, I, I would, we could start uh, with like the filming choices and some of the like decisions that we had to make. Um, for example, I think particularly with a lot of public, people with a lot of public presence, um, they have, there's a way in which people know them based on what they access in public is, you know, from probably what like, Boniface is really big on social media um in is in Kenyan press so if if we would if you were having a protest or anything like that it will be extremely well covered like in the press so to a point that you generally don't need that much of that because that's kind of what is out there and that point of view is there the thing because that becomes important is how was his morning before he got there for example you know, and what, where is his family when all this is happening at the same time? So for example, you would easily, there would be probably a protest and I would have a cinematographer at the protest and one at home when it doesn't look like there's even a protest going on. Um, there, there's, there'd be very many instances where even it'll be like at the end of the day where you you feel you know like you're filming the day of a protest for example which feels like the most important thing but for me the most important thing is the ride home when when the kids are calling and be like where are you <laughs> you know yeah my sister has refused to you know has refused to take in my book and i want it back tell her to give it back to me at that point the kids don't care if you're an activist or not you know, <laughs> the kids just want their dad. And I think that's, that for me is became really important as a nuance in understanding that while the world only cares about the political points of view, at home, there's a different expectation. And a lot of activists, and in this case, like Boniface, Boniface consistently was saying, I'm doing this for my family. Right. And there is an expectation from his family of him. And that's the balance he has to fight and play. And there's this very telling moment in, in the film, which is like was totally unexpected. Um, because I was filming in the car and they were going, um, I think they're either going to see their in-laws or something. And they, they were in the car and they were having a whole other different conversation around I think beauty pageants or something and and all of a sudden they shift I think then Boniface is like you know what maybe I should just stop caring about everything you know and Jerry just pivots that conversation into yes you should you should totally make your family number one and it becomes it becomes a, a which is like a debate of their lives, which is what comes first. And for me, that was a very powerful moment. And I think that's that's one of those moments that kind of guarantee and show you where this the story is. And as as filmmakers, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a visual moment that speaks to what your film is about. Like if you get that, that's like documentary gold. Because if you if you get those moments um, where like in, in Softy, the, where the son is praying for his dad to get a better job. It's like, you, you don't plan for that because the whole time you're like, oh my God, is it recording? Because that, that's where your eye is. <laughs> like it's recording, I have this. And that, that, those moments are what we live for. And I think personally, that's why I'm literally still making documentary. Because it's those moments that give you so much value and honesty in the, to the human condition, to 
to the sacrifice that people are making in our case, in Boniface's case, like, like this is why I'm doing this and this is who I'm doing this for. And it's not easy. Um, in regards to fundraising and if you're if, like thinking of how do you place pivot your project, um, I, I don't know how many people would agree with me or find this controversial, but I think anytime you're pitching the film, you need to be very clear in your mind that you have to pitch the best version of your film. You, you're not pitching what's in your mind of what, what you think the film will be per se. Like, let me phrase it in a different way. It's like, based on the material you have, and based on, because all you're trying to do is get the right collaborators to execute the dream you have. I think for me, that's priority. Finding the right people and talking to the right people. There is no need for you to hurry and talk to someone or a group or an organization that has a different agenda or has a different way of looking at things just because they have funding available because that just breeds a whole other problem down the line. So it might actually be a better benefit of you to wait to get to a point where your film or the story that you're trying to tell makes sense to the people that you want to collaborate with instead of rushing very quickly or being like, cause that's, I find like that's what a lot of filmmakers do. Um, and I'm, I'm guilty of that. Because you, you, you know, your friends are the first. Every time there's a fund <laughs> posted or there's a link posted, they're like, oh, I have a documentary friend of mine. I have someone who does this. And our guilt is like, we are quickly to apply to all these funds. And we're just like, something will stick somewhere. But the reality is not everything that sticks is a good thing. And that's, that's just the honest truth. And... I'm, I'm really lucky that I've, so far I've worked with people who are genuinely interested in, in collaborating in the films, the different films that I'm a part of, because I'm also producing certain films. And even in the films we're producing, a lot of the people we're talking to or have come on board as partners are interested in the subject matter, interested in the filmmaker, interest, like interested in building and telling um these stories it's more complicated for african filmmakers because african stories are not as welcome in the to the globe but it's looking for those collaborators and those synergies to build that out but the other thing that we have to remember as well is we're we're trying to tell global stories and if we're trying to tell global stories we also need to concede to the global story and the global story in this case would allow you to also access um, a greater group of people and a greater group of collaborators that I think would eventually make good of you know, whatever vision that you have as a storyteller. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Very wise words. And you certainly had many golden moments in your documentary, including the, the, the Father's Day letter to, to the mm -hmm. mother. That's brilliant. But we are going to move swiftly to Miriam. Miriam, so sorry we had to make you wait for so long, but we look forward to your presentation and we hope there's some time after for questions. We look forward to it. Over to you, Miriam. Thank you so much, Shamila. Just let me try and get my PowerPoint back up very quickly. Um, uh, can everyone see? Yes, we can see. It's all good. Awesome. Okay, so I'll try my best to go quickly on this one. Um, so in terms of impact, um, I came onto the Softy project, as I said earlier, around um, about eight months be prior to the Sundance premiere. Um, I came on kind of just um, to strategize around what impact can look like for the film um, and you know just kind of work alongside um, Soko and Tony um, to be able to figure out what's the best ways to get the film out to the audience that um, it reflects. So 
Um, just to show this, uh, the Sundance picture with the family, we're very happy to bring, you know, have the whole family there, including the kids. Um, but let me just get straight on to the impact goals. So after um, doing a, you know, a, a bunch of research, having some um, brain trust where we brought um, key stakeholders within the civic space, within the activism space um, to watch the film and you know, give us kind of feedback on what the key messages they felt were br most brought from the, from the film. Um, we were able to come with this kind of strategy around, um, around Softy. So in terms of key messages, what we came up with had a, a lot to do around kind of sparking up active citizenship. How we express our love for country is through engaging um, with our society and working to, you know, working hard to see how we can make it better every day. Um, another thing that we got from the film is that we can we cannot separate the personal from the political, and that um, systemic problems exist, but we can also work um, in a collective to catalyze change with our communities. So our key impact goals with the film centered on creating a space for Kenyans to reflect, um, to challenge ourselves and each other on our collective roles in fighting for justice, equity, um, progress, a more inclusive society, better leaders, just um, a kind of a strong reflection on who am I as a person and, and within my community and being able to you know, push for the change that uh, we need for a better future. Um, also to enable an environment for increased active citizen participation and embolden viewers to start to um, challenge the status quo. Um, because the film, um, as we talked about earlier, is a multi-layered one where there's an intimate family story placed within a larger historic, historical politi political narrative um, that we see that there are patterns that have been um, persisting through each election cycle. So we wanted the film to be able for us to see how can we change that status quo. Um, the audience that we were focusing on was a large one, the Kenyan public, <laughs> um, and both local and abroad, but with kind of sub, um, sub audiences focused on uh, activists, um, youth, um, targeting schools and universities, and even the Kenyan diaspora. Um, our strategy was one focus, it was two pronged. It was uh, focusing on distribution and awareness, um, and then that feeding into our um, impact and community engagement. So that's why for us, the Sundance, um, the Sundance uh, um, premiere was such a big one because it gave us such a, a big boost in terms of awareness, but also credibility here in Kenya, um, um, globally, but especially here in Kenya, a lot of it put um, the film on the on the radar. Um, so when we were coming back from Sundance, um, very excited to do a premiere back um, home in Kenya. Uh, this was uh, we got back around February, and then you know COVID hit in March. So that really took us for a spin in terms of how were we going to be able to you know uh, premiere the film at home, get the film out. Um, um, in the communities, because for us, uh, the the digital space was not a space that we thought we can get as much reach. So we were really um, trying to figure out, and we had to put things on pause, plans on pause for a while, um, with regard to how we were going to get the film out. But in terms of the strategy, it was to do a premiere, um, get as much press and PR, and use the awards that we were gaining to really gain awareness and credibility. So that once we um, just started to share the film. Um, yeah, people will be excited. People will be uh, proud of the film that was that's coming straight from Kenya. And I think um, the strategy worked. So by October, things had um, kind of calmed down a bit in terms of COVID here in Kenya and theaters had opened. And so we were able to actually do a premiere and theatrical release here. Um, we did it on October 16th of last year. We were, we had uh, three uh, cities we were able to do it in Nairobi, in the coast of Kenya and another city, um, uh, Nakuru. And um, it was a big hit. Like we were very shocked of how much response that we got from um, the film. This, these are pictures from the premiere itself that we had um, on October 16th. Um, just a very, uh, we were trending number one on social media that night, which was awesome. Again, really focusing on our goal towards getting as much um, reach and awareness as possible. And, um, 
we had such great uh, feedback on socials and also just directly around you know, what the film meant to people. And we were very happy to see that um, though the film again has a larger political um, and historical narrative, the family element and the intimacy of that really, um, I think hit people the most and allowed people to kind of see through the po political and um, be able to kind of you know, understand what activism and politics means within the context of a, a family, of a community. Um, so these are just a few samples of um, the kind of feedback that we've gotten from, um, from people who have been watching the film. Um, we were able to get a lot of good press um, around that time as well, locally. Um, the Boniface and Jerry were able to do a bunch of radio shows, TV shows, we were on print. Um, so that's a strategy that we really, again, really worked hard to be able to build that awareness. Um, we had a really strong social media presence, um, right? As of now on our Instagram, we are 3000 plus, Twitter 3000 plus, Facebook 10,000 plus. Um, and we also, one strategy that we used was to do a music video to the, the um, end credit song um, of the film called um, Now Nambali. Um, so I think that all of these kind of came together for the film to, for us to use social media as a way of, of reach. And um, we were very keen on our design and, you know, just being clear on the different steps you can take um, to support the film and, you know, support the themes of the film. Um, just quickly on awards, awards was a big part of our strategy and you just using awards for credibility. And here's just a list of some of the awards that um, we got um, last year and this year. Um, we also were able to attempt an Oscar um, awards campaign. And we were so happy when Lupita Nyong'o watched the film and very, really much um, connected and related to the themes of the film. And we were able to do a panel with her. So that really helped us in our push um, for, the for the campaign. And it helped us build our profile and again, um, hit our credibility um, kind of objective around impact. Um, we did attempt to do a digital release as well. Um, and it was, it was a good experience just to see how that worked. One thing that we saw though, was that the uptake was not as strong. Um, I think there's still low penetration um, in, our, in our locale in terms of you know, people wanting to see, watch things digitally, uh, if it's not with a, a big, you know, um, a, a Netflix or something like that, you know, so, but it was a good experiment for us to see um, what that could look like. And it kind of um, encouraged uh, this kind of idea of how can we kind of build this, this side of, of um, releasing um, in the East African context. Um, right now we are focusing on um, the, the we're really now gone out, out of the distribution phase and into the impact phase. So we are going into community screenings. We started um, screenings actually a few weeks ago um, outside of Nairobi in the different counties in Kenya. Um, I have a picture here from our first screening at Maseno University in Kisumu. Um, and we're really focusing on um, universities and community centers. And it's been really awesome. Um, the, the response, similar to what I showed you in terms of the premiere, the response has been really positive and um, we've gotten really great um, conversations out of that. And um, the next steps is um, for us to just continue to push the film out through community screenings to, and our goal is to build a community of Kenyan citizens who are informed and emboldened to challenge the status quo through the power of their vote by now December, 2022, or next, next year where our elections, we're actually having elections coming up in August of 2022. So we are, we feel like the film is gonna be even more pertinent um, in terms of screenings and getting it out um, uh, next year. We're also really working on a, a nation, nationwide broadcast because for us, that is the best way we can reach um, throughout the nation. And that looks like it'll be coming short soon in a few weeks. So we're very excited about that. Um, another thing that we're working on is a citizen's handbook that will be a companion tool at, at the community screenings where we, we will give out, um, and it kind of just outlines these um, impact goals that we have around engagement, citizen engagement, how to support activists, um, what does it mean for you to, you know, um, stand up in your community. So that's something we're working on as well. And um, as I mentioned before, we've started our community screenings, um, piloting in four counties and hope to continue on throughout um, next year. 
Um, a lot of the learnings that we've had um, in, in this impacts uh, journey is adaptability, that once the ball starts rolling, just buckle, buckle up and be ready to pivot whenever necessary. Um, there's also the power of momentum, that impact is dynamic and is consistently shifting, and you just have to do work with the current opportunities and restraints that you had. So yeah, with COVID that came, we had to kind of pivot and figure out how to, you know, um, still reach our audiences um, through that. That's why we ended up trying the, you know, the digital release. Then we were able to come back and do the, the physical premiere. Um, then there was kind of a lull. Then we kind of picked up again with community screening. So things have been, you know, the energy has been up and down. But when you know what your goals are, when you know what your objectives are, it's um, much easier and clearer to be able to move forward. Um, in terms of timing, I think in starting an impact campaign is great to bring in an impact producer or someone who's gonna focus on that plan. Um, around the time that I came in, maybe six months prior to when you're um, starting wanting to release, just so you can have time to be able to, um, you know, get all those elements together. And um, one thing that uh, we had some unintended results throughout the, the, the premiere and all the screenings that we're having um, on social media, we, we see that a lot of um, our audiences have, you know, this fist up and, you know, like it's become like a, a rallying cry around, you know, the film. So that's been an unintended results. Um, and during the, during the um, theatrical run that we had, um, we had people calling us to want to purchase tickets for others who may not be able to afford so that they can go watch. So it became a very strong collective movement that we were very excited about. Um, and lastly, um, yeah, strong communications. We really use social media to our advantage um, throughout this impact campaign. And um, yeah, just investing in a strong communication strategy is was very key for us as well. Um, so I'll just end with this. Uh, what is your style of activism? That's kind of like a key question that we have within our impact campaign. Um, if you go on our website, you can take this quiz and you can figure out which softy character um, you most relate to with regards to, um, to activism. And um, yeah, we hope that you can continue to follow us and see how we continue on this journey um, of impact with softy. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Miriam. That was very illuminating and a lot for us to draw from, draw on. Um, there are some questions from Liani and Mickey, and I'm wondering whether it might be nice, we don't have too much of time, but for Mickey and Liani maybe to ask them. Um, uh, Mickey, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Me on the spot there, but sure. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not in my PJs. Um, so thanks, Sam. Thanks, Miriam. It's so great to hear from you. And it's, yeah, very inspiring because sometimes when you're in a film, you think that it, it's so much easier for other filmmakers, you know, and it's <laughs> that you also really struggled for many years. So um, very encouraging indeed. I guess, I mean, one of, I thought one of the things I was wondering when I watched the film, if there was a school's edit, because you know, I really wanted to show to my 15 year old son and 13 year old daughter, but I just thought some of the scenes were so violent um, and understandably so, but quite hard to consume if, you, if you're still young and you're very impressionable. And I was just wondering if there is an alternative edit or if you're thinking about that for a, for a kind of a school's youth campaign. Um, so we, we have done a 52 minute cut down on the film. Um, that I think we're, we're trying to use for like universities and high schools uh, to that in that conversation and it does kind of minimize the violent scenes and a lot of the other stuff that um, you want to make the film a lot more digestible to an, a younger audience. Mm -hmm. Great we look forward to seeing that and maybe thinking of how we can because I think it is a great tool for activism it's a great tool for discussion um mm -hmm. and I definitely know groups here that we could use it so look forward mm -hmm. to seeing that and maybe becoming part of that part of the campaign Maria yeah yeah definitely thanks for that Mickey um I think I might be was under a, a, a laboring under a mistake as I understand the session ends at 5 30 not five uh, are we all is that understood okay so it's just me that thought <laughs> it ended at five so I'm so happy to hear that 
uh, yeah, I was panicking a bit thinking there's just a few more minutes, but we look forward to more conversation. So I'll go on then with Liani. Liani, would you like to ask your, quest your questions around impact? I would love to. Um, hi, Sam. Hi, Miriam. Thank you so much for coming to okay. share your experiences with us. This is such a, a cool um, opportunity to learn from you. Um, I have so many questions, it's going to be very difficult to pick one, um, but uh, Miriam, I'm very interested to find out, you know, we, we often think in impact about the stuff that we as an impact team can do, and there's so much power in inspiring the audience to take the film to their networks. To what extent have you found, and I, I realize that you're still at the beginning of your impact campaign, but, you know, your film has played in very in lots of different spaces as as you mentioned to what extent have you found that softy has inspired audience members to sort of take up the baton and ask you whether they can host screenings or how they can you know help you whether they can introduce you to potential partners share screening information to their networks and um if if so what value do you see in sort of mobilizing the audience to help with your campaign mm -hmm. yes um mo mobilizing the audience to to help with the campaign is one of the key ways that we want to continue to have the impact campaign be sustainable so even after the premiere um, we got a lot of, of queries. How can I, you know, screen this to my, you know, communities? I work for this organization, or I'm at this school, or so. Um, yeah, we've we've kind of put together a process of how to do that, and I think I, I kind of skipped over it in the presentation. But we have a host of screening program where people, yeah, who um, they call in, especially for community-based organizations, residents associations. Um, people who we feel that you know the, the film really reflects um you know them um we're able to provide a way a process for them to screen the film um so right now it things are act um, picking up again because um uh our, we started community screenings this month and also the host of screen pro screening program this month um because COVID has opened up um and we we had a curfew here that has been lifted so it's a bit now more easy to kind of have those screenings and we're excited to yeah we've gotten a lot of requests and we're just pushing with that and hoping to continue with that um, into next year but I think that's one of the key things um the audience is are the most excited to when an audience is the most excited to share the film that's I think that's the dream of you know a film team and impact producer Producer, you know, it's like they want to take it forward. It's not about us. Because I think the goal of a film team and an impact producer is at the end, you don't, you're not, you're not um, needed anymore. You know, the film takes us a life of its own. And all you have to do is just facilitate um, the life that it, it has with um, the people who um, are its biggest fans. So okay. Thanks for that. Sam, if I might uh, ask a question and take it back to the filmmaking process just a bit earlier on. Obviously, I mean, you spoke about filming a few things at the beginning of the process and then 2016 and a lot was happening. Um, obviously, you were fundraising at different times and fundraising is always patchy. But I'm just, I mean, if you could just maybe share with us what kind you know how did you make your filming decisions there's potentially so much to film i mean you had probably had some key events but just for you know filmmakers out there who are daunted there's so much happening your character is living in the same city you always want to film there's considerations around funding but there's also considerations about not just filming everything the person does so maybe you can just share with us how you uh, how you went about that uh, yeah. Um, I think from the beginning, I think was the like, like I think like I said, we, we started mostly filming with protests and the organization of in and around protests, but then it kind of shifted into people could only watch protests so much, <laughs> like enough of like you can't film you can't film everything like you can't film protests enough, but it it kind of became important to figure out like what exactly do you want from what you're going to film like what's what's the what's the what aspect of what you're filming is has the potential of actually adding value to whichever angle of the story you're going to tell um a very an ex a very simple example is 
And we filmed this one protest and I remember being very clear to the cinematographer of if anything happens, just follow the police. You don't have to follow the protesters. And that was because the amount of time I had spent in protest situations and looking at protests is we have so much attention paid to the protesters that we almost never see how the police react. And that became very beneficial when we were editing because you could see how much the police were enjoying beating up people. And, and that gives you a different angle and aspect of looking at a different dimension of looking at your story. Um, in regards of what do you pick and where do you concentrate on and how do you, um, how do you should, I, I think it's, it's a very tricky balance. Um, primarily because it's the only reason why you'd want to film so much. I think it's because you're, you generally don't know what your story is. And I think it's important for you to figure out what your story is before putting in so much effort and weight to film everything. Unless what you're filming is like, in our case, we were filming an election and that kind of became complicated because we, you film as much as you can because you genuinely don't know what's going to happen in the campaign trail. But it was clear that we're filming the election. That, you know, so it's not that we're filming every day, but we probably try to film every two weeks at least. Like we would have, we'll be filming something. Um, and you had to be okay to miss stuff because you would miss a lot. Like you would, the day you didn't go to film, you would be told, oh my God, that was the best day ever. Or we met, you don't know what happened. Like this, like, but willowing in the loss doesn't really help. And you, you kind of, you, you, you just need to always remember that your audience doesn't know what you did shoot and it's fine. So the the pressure in which I think it's it's a it's uh it is an important pressure to have in like what do we film what do we film, but it's important for you to spend the time to figure out what is your story like what is important because if 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 you know what is important then perhaps like in our case it's better to film the family than go for the protest because that's the part you're like something might happen there there are many times nothing happened but we were lucky they were we were there when stuff happened and i i feel the parts we've missed probably would have made a better film but we'll never know because what we filmed is what we ended up working with and i believe worked and still told the story that we were trying to tell um yeah i think that that that's that's how i feel about that Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam, for that. So we we do have another question for you, Sam. But um, before we get that, get to that, I just want to um, say to anybody who has a who might have a question for Miriam, whether they would just send it through or put up their hands. I think Miriam also um, was as uh, confused as I was about the time, and she has to leave early and she has another engagement. But Miriam, I mean, you've You've schooled us and it was a great presentation. So um, thank you for that. If you have to leave, we totally understand. Um, thanks for sharing your presentation with us, but I just like to check with anybody if they would like to ask Miriam a question. Um, I mean, if not, I, maybe I, I would just ask, is there anybody who wants to ask Miriam a specific question about impact before she goes? Um, so Miriam, I'm also, I'm, maybe I'm just interested in, um, you know, obviously your Boniface, he is, you know, he comes with sort of a political ideology or, a, you know, he has certain political beliefs. And obviously that might not be shared by the range of audience that you're trying to make an impact. I'm just interesting, how do you navigate, you know, uh, get, you know, as, this is a very political, can, can be a very political climate. So how do you navigate getting a bigger audience with a film about a, a character who is, you know, uh, putting forward a particular politics? 
Yeah, so as I was mentioning before, I feel that we, um, the narrative that we really pushed in terms of um, when we released the film was the family story as opposed to the, the political context. Um, and because we feel that that's where people can empathize, that's where people can see themselves, that's where people can really reflect. Um, and that really worked. And um, I think, and that's, that's what, um, we were shocked too, because we were very scared about the political element kind of overtaking everything and maybe creating divisive conversation. But so far that hasn't been the case. The family element has been the, the, the stronger point. And even when we go out um, for the screenings, we, we don't just bring Boniface, we bring Njeri as well. And because I think that really em exemplifies the family element and her story um, is the, the story a lot of people actually seem to connect with a lot. Um, was like at, at Sundance, at, you know, at the premiere, um, Jerry became the star, you know? And so that was something also that we didn't um, anticipate, but it's been wonderful to see that as well, because it shows that, you know, um, we do have this, um, this great character in Boniface, but also in Jerry's story is as equally important. And we've been able to kind of front that. Um, so the political element um, hasn't been as, um, as, uh, uh, divisive as we thought it would, would be. And we're just hoping that as we continue on with the screenings that that continues to, to be the case, yeah. But I think yeah, the family narrative has been uh, um, key in that. Okay, thanks. Marim, one last question, please, if I may, that is from the audience before you leave us. Uh, the question, and I'll read it. Mainstream media press coverage is so important to an impact campaign, especially for your raise awareness goal. Did you have to work hard to get the press interested in the story or did they come to you due to festival and awards strategy? And if the former, if it was the former, what was your PR strategy? Mm -hmm. um, and Soko, you can chime in on this as well. Um, but I think it was a mixture of both. I think um, we, we really worked hard to reach out to, to press um, different outlets. Um, and we had a, a PR, a someone, a PR specialist based here who was able to kind of get us into those networks. Um, I think, yeah, the, the, the credibility that we got with all the international festivals really helped us and we used that as leverage. Um, and also I think um, with Boniface being a, a big uh, uh, like character here in Kenya, I think we were able to, it helps sometimes and it hurts sometimes depending on, again, the political, you know, um, the person who was looking, who, who was the, the, at the head of whatever publication that we were looking at. Um, but yeah, and so in terms of um, print, in terms of radio, it wasn't so difficult. Though we've had ha had some issues trying to get the national, the, the TV broadcast this year. Um, I don't know, Soko, if you want to talk about that. Um, yeah, I think it, it's what you're saying in terms of uh, like building the PR and the messaging from the beginning of it being a family story, I think we really became like a bedrock of our engagements. Um, um, it, it, it did to a point not in on a global level, not service to the best that we hoped it would. Um, primarily, again, because there's, there is a, a global view of stories that come from Africa and you kind of end up being bandwagoned in like an African story, whatever that is. And it, it, it becomes uh, complicated sometimes to pitch to, to different people, to different um, media spaces. But we did have a PR person even at, our, our, at Sundance. Um, we did get a PR person for our local premiere we are working with a PR person for, for community screenings, just primarily because we believe there's different angles and engagements within the film and stories within the film. And the more people understanding the film uh, help in encourage more people to watch the film. And, and I think that the greatest uh, impediment we faced is perception because people, a lot of people think they know what the film is about until they watch it, um, particularly Kenyans. So we've we've had like we had like a ton of people at the beginning being like oh, I don't know this kind. Um, a, a story we share is even our theatrical distributor at the beginning when we were had in Kenya. They were like ah oh, you know we're not sure, but then we're like just watch it, just watch it, and then because they uh, even going into documentaries we've never done a documentary before, so. 
but then all of a sudden they watch it and they're like yeah this thing can work we can do this and and i think it it's that's what the pr was for it's kind of because enc- people get curious that they can't be all these people saying these things so let me let's try to watch it um and that um the the political has been problematic with the national broadcast because they are wary um of whether um if there'll be any retaliation against them or there'll be any you know there's there's this kind of the lands the media landscape which we we live in but again we're trying to be like you know just watch it we we had like a, a a screening of the 52 minute version in one of the stations this past monday um and there was a local festival uh the nbo fest that had like we had like free screenings and they had like limited tickets for the film and the tickets the tickets just sold out in an hour two hours and and they kind you see and the interest has kind of changed how how people want to engage with the film and how the media wants to access the film so we we just like Miriam said I think we've just been adapting as we go along thank you thank you Sam and Miriam I think we have to say goodbye to you so thanks so much for sharing your insights and your campaign with us and yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'll share my um, email in the chat if anyone else has further questions they would like to ask in the future. Thank you so much. Thanks, Miriam. Bye. 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 And we're still also, I'm going to pose a question from an attendee. Um, so I'll read it. Uh, yes, and we back. Well, this is the, the question that a lot of people want to know as they're editing their own forms. Um, so the question is, was there a particular point in the edit when you just knew you'd found the story, a crucial element that fell into place that made the story work? Or was it a gradual process of layering, cutting, cutting and recutting? Ha, e- in in as much as I don't want to admit it, yes, there was a point because for the for a very long time we um and there's this meme I saw once that speaks to the process of documentary editing where you're like my film is crap, it's terrible, and so we were in the phase of my film is terrible for for several months and kind of not being sure what is the best angle to tell the story from because you have all these scenes because what what we did so that we could keep going is we edited a bunch of scenes like all the every time we'd have a footage would make you know try to make it a scene so you ended up having long long scenes um and then one of the editors which we co-edited with ryan mullins um just came i would say cracked the back of the film um essentially kind of like made certain very clear choices of what if we tried this and all of a sudden when we watched what he did it kind of like yes if you did this then we can do this then we can do this and i think in working in that way that was probably a process of three months three four months that's which led to our first draft cut because i think our first draft cut was the indicator for we have a film the first rough cut and the final film are pretty different but the pieces of the film is the same so it was more of like this is what you're trying to say is just the best scene to say it then they'll be like no no, no that we have another scene switch it and and that i think that moment is what when we realized this is what the film is about and it's um yeah thank you thanks for that no the mysterious process of editing and i think you started the bar very high at the beginning with the pig scene and to get start to form with such a, a strong scene and then to keep it up is, is a big expectation mm-hmm. and i guess the just the, the follow-up question about what you spoke about is um i mean i guess you had a lot i mean you had a lot of material and 
you were looking for the scenes that really crystallize the story you want to tell so i mean did you go did you try did you speak with your through with your ed, other editors about sort of the emotional arc and the kind of scenes that would and then narrow it down or i mean if you could just maybe tell us how from a bulk of material what kind of sort of editing questions you might have had along the way and what were the difficulties as well the challenges when you're trying to build the story up in the edit uh, so i think there's I'm I'm really big on emotional arcs and emotional journeys and and I think it became first I think two things that are really important is what scenes do we have at the most powerful like what do we have that is visually compelling and we kind of that just there's there's only so much you maybe have three you maybe have four if you're very lucky some even just have one and you're like what are the most visually compelling scenes that you have and sometimes it's working around them and seeing how do you get to them like how do you get to the scene how are they connected so it was i think that's where we started we started with these are the most powerful scenes we have so how do we how do we get from them and i think that's what allowed us to be like we can start with a very powerful big scene that with super energy high energy high octane engagement because we knew we had other scenes that would either raise the bar to the same level or even higher so it's like what what are the, what were those scenes? so it's putting those scenes and then mapping them out the other thing that the second thing that is also important is what are the turning points emotional turning points that we have in this film um from say boniface's decision to run for office that was an emotional turning point we were lucky to have filmed the moment his wife found out so when when that happens that becomes something we can build we can build on so it becomes something to be like at what point do you want to get there emotionally how do you react because it's um an example i would give if if that scene comes earlier then you don't understand boniface enough so it's highly likely that you might react differently to him if that film comes later then your stakes are a lot less because you're like you've been there too long to kind of understand why should you care in the first place so it became important to figure out where's the best place to put a scene like that where you kind of understand what boniface is trying to do but at the same time you also understand jerry's reaction so in 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 those kind of those turning points become very key key pieces of the puzzle as you're trying to put the film together so it it's it's picking this this two things your powerful scenes and your turning points and figuring out where where do you bless best put them and how do you build the worlds around them thanks stan that's very instructive um i'm going to take a question from the floor and i think i didn't see sila sila's hand up so would you like to ask your question directly to sam can you Hi, Sam. Um, I'm Hi. a screenwriter. I, I really enjoyed your talk. Thanks so much. Very, very informative and, and very well articulated as well. So thank you very, very much. I'm a screenwriter and I have done documentaries before, but um, under the guidance of producers, I've been commissioned to write whatever I've needed to write. But now I'm actually initiating my own documentary, which is also a social activism documentary, but not politically oriented. And, and from a screenwriter's point of view, and really I, I'm, I'm trying to fathom out how the heck to start this thing. And, um, and, and I think I know the answer to my question already, but I'm going to answer it ask it in any case did you develop a treatment to work from or did you exclusively work from footage um 
mostly from footage, um, then developed a treatment. Uh, prim- I think I, I'm as a, my general style is investing a lot in the characters and kind of figuring out where what their hopes dreams journeys like what what that is and then kind of navigate that now into what the film could be uh because um um i think characters are your are your gems characters are your okay. they're your jewels in in anything that you you'll be working on so i think it it's 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 i'm 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 all about if you find the right character, then it it'll kind of it makes it a bit easier in developing your your storyline or your treatment or whatever thing you want to because because they they would actually guide you and you just see or you can just have ideas of where you feel the story is going. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That helps. Thank you. Thanks for that, Sam. And if maybe if I can stay with characters then, um, was it, I mean, I guess you had individual relationships with uh, Bonnie Face and Jerry, and it was interesting that, you know, she was speaking to you about certain things and he was disclosing certain big things like his running the first time to her. These were big moments I mean she also seems quite private but then you really get intimate with her he seems quite pu- so what I'm interested in with this a family I mean firstly I guess two questions I'll put them together one I mean was it was gaining access gaining trust was it uh, something that happened quite quickly for you was it a slow burn over time were there hiccups in the relationship is there things that you they didn't want in the film that you had to negotiate around. I mean, maybe you can just speak to us about how you approached char- uh, characters. So uh, I think I built relationships with them separately. And that's, that's very interesting. Um, such that I have a different relationship with every single member of that family, <laughs> which is including the children. So even the, 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 the kids would, text me or call me separately to tell me something that they are thinking about, which does has no involvement with their parents. Um, and and b- that took time. That was, uh, that it wasn't like um, this, it, it was, it took all that as taken time and continued to develop as, as the film um, was being made. Um, they had absolutely no control of what I ended up in the film. And a really quick story was the day I showed them the film for the first time, they were extremely nervous because they had not seen the, because imagine someone filming you for, for five years and they disappear for another year and a half saying they're editing. And all of a sudden being like, hey, um, I want you guys to see what we put together. Of course, it was nerve-wracking for me, um, and even <laughs> extremely nerve-wracking for them, because they had no idea what parts they were. Um, parts of them were scared of, you know, Boniface was scared. What did Jerry tell me that he doesn't know? She was scared. What did he tell me that she doesn't know? Um, so for Jerry spent um, most of the campaign. On in the film was the first time for her to actually see what was happening um, in Kenya when she was away. So there were so many aspects and angles of the film where they they'd never seen before, um, and that I think in I think they said they've not they've watched the film twice, which was at the premiere at Sundance and the Kenyan premiere, and they said they're never watching it again. <laughs> <laughs> because the film for them is a very traumatic experience. It brings back, because for us it's two minutes, but for them it's a whole day. For them it's it's six months. Um, but they they are biggest supporters of everyone to watch the film, and they talk of they get asked questions about it all the time. Um, yeah. Okay. 
Wow, thanks. Thanks for that, Sam. Well, we've come to the end of our session. So I'm going to ask the last time if we can, if there is a question from the audience, if I can, we can squeeze that in. Um, if you can just put your hand up if there is. Uh, if not, um, we're going to say, Sam, thank you so much. That was really incredible. Uh, deep diving and sharing your craft and your experiences with us. We appreciate it. Um, and on behalf of the DFA, we'd also just like to thank our sponsors for the session, uh, Doc A, the Gauteng Film Commission, and also uh, SA Screen Sector Support and all our members. Thank you to all of you for joining today once again. Thanks, Sam and Miriam and the rest of the team. And yeah, goodbye. Yes, um, I've shared my email on the chat. You feel free to reach out if you have any questions. What are you doing in New York, Sam? Um, um, we're, edit we're in the first phase of editing a documentary we've been working on for the last four years. I'm co-directing a film that is following the world's largest experiment on universal basic income. Wow. That's quite a mouthful. I look forward to yes. seeing. It's it's a lot. So I'm um, I'm in I'm in that phase of like, oh my film is terrible. <laughs> Nothing. I'm so relieved to yeah. know that you as well. How is that thing going? Yeah, it's it's I'm I'm I think I'm enjoying it. Uh, because there's I, I like the two two different perspectives of of life and things and that really i think it has really enriched our film um i can't wait for guys to watch it because <laughs> you know you sometimes you feel you're living in your own bubble <laughs> so yeah. we're working towards our our rough cut so hopefully yeah. who's hopefully, editing for you yeah. Um, same, uh, one of the editors, Ryan, I mentioned him, he's oh, one of our co-editors for Softy. So Ryan is our editor on this. Um, yeah, so hopefully we have a rough cut and then we'll start thinking about festivals. Okay, well, good luck yeah. with that. Thank good you, time. thank you. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. So much much Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Sam. Thank you, Lila. Oh, okay. pleasure. Thank uh, you so much, Lila. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. Thanks, Lamise. Thanks, Liani. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Shamila. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.